Before we get started on today's show, let me tell you about the Oxford Exxon Highway 6 West there in Oxford. You can get your daiquiris, you can get your lunch specials, $4.99, two sides of bread, 32-ounce drink, the ribs at night, and also remember the 49-cent bottomless refill. You go in, you buy the stadium cup. Every time you come back by a Blue Sky location in Mississippi, 49 cents to refill that and quench your thirst with the Oxford Exxon. Also coming to you from the Clark Ford Studio, 662-257-1900. Highway 25 South there in Amory, Mississippi is Clark Ford. Give Corey Clark a call. Within 15 minutes during business hours, you're going to have yourself a quote. Shop it around. Take it. Whatever you would like to do. But you're going to come back to Corey. And when you do, tell him you heard about him on the podcast. $500 off that deal with Clark Ford. Now on to the show. From the Clark Ford Studio in Oxford, Mississippi, MBW Digital proudly presents the Oxford Exxon Podcast. I'd say thanks for tuning in. But why am I going to give you a round of applause for something you're supposed to do, to be frank? And now, here are your hosts, Chase Parm. And broadcast school has really paid off. And Neil McCready. I deserve to be on TV. Welcome to this Tuesday edition of the Oxford Exxon Podcast. Chase Parm, Neil McCready. We are going to talk with one J.G. Tate. Today on the show, in advance of Ole Miss and Auburn tomorrow night, that's the ESPN2 for that one. It is a 6 o'clock tip, so we'll talk to Jay here in a bit about the Tigers and the Rebels, the Auburn basketball team led by Bruce Pearl. Neil, we uh, probably will skip a complete bachelor uh, route, but did you get your fill last night? Well, <clears throat> I'm pretty far under the weather. I, I did not feel good yesterday, about 3, 4 o'clock, and... Um, I sort of dozed through a lot of it. I watched it. Um, I saw I saw enough to get my my fill of it, but I did not. I did not sit and take notes or anything. I did not. I did not feel well. You know me. I'm very hot natured. I normally don't need a lot of. Uh, I like the cold. And yesterday, I was wearing about four shirts, a sweatshirt, and two blankets, trying to stay warm, and I couldn't do it. So I was just kind of napping. So I, I'm not really sure that I could. Uh, I'm sure to the vast disappointment of our listeners, I could not do a uh, a tremendous bachelor breakdown other than to say that, as I expected, there were uh, there were a couple of plants. They've uh, they found a psychopath. Her name is Catherine, and um, she survived the first round, as you knew that she would, because they need to keep her on because she's going to create. She's guaranteed at least final four. Um, my guess is that she won't make it that far. Okay, my guess cool. is she'll make final six or seven because she's so dramatic that that will wear thin after a while. But she's the villain. Uh, there's a couple of beauty pageant girls, North Carolina and, uh, and Alabama. Um, leave it to the bachelor. If there's a girl from Texas, they play country music. If there's a girl from Alabama, they play hillbilly music. It, they're, they're very much into stereotypes, but, uh, but it all in all was a uh, it was an interesting interesting first night on the program and um, I'm I'm not gonna lie to you I'm looking forward to next Monday. Fair enough. Yeah, yesterday morning you did not seem to feel great. It has gotten worse. I guess throughout the day we're we're on Skype today basically to protect me because there's a possibility that you think it might be some throat issue which I cannot take into my house with my daughter at the moment. So we're uh, doing this online and we'll uh, we'll make it through as we always do. If you made me guess, I would guess it's flu and or strep. Oh, good. So I will, uh, we're taping, or I'm taping with uh, Gary Parrish for tomorrow's show at 10. And when that show's over, I'm going to go to the doctor and see if I can't get a needle in both cheeks. Are you doing a quick urgent care doc in the box thing, or are you trying to go to the oh, actual general practitioner? In Oxford? Come on. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, doc in the box, man. I mean, if I called to make an appointment right now, I'd be like, we'll see you at Christmas. I think we use the same clinic. They have a walk-in clinic. Yeah, but I'd be there till four. Okay, that's fair. I mean, I, yeah, I have no problem with the doc in the box. I was just asking. I mean, I, I'm going to walk in. I know what it is. I'm going to say, I've got, I've got strep. I might have the flu, so go ahead and swab me for both. Run the test. I'm going to take a little nap in here on the table while you do that. And then come back, and you're going to give me a steroid shot, and you're going to give me an antibiotic shot, and you're going to give me a, a Z-pack. That's what we're going to do. I mean, it, this is 
I'm going to give you 20 bucks and, and uh, we're going to roll. There is one doc in the box that will get you out about five times faster than the other one. I'm not going to call out. I'm, I'm, I guess you might should, but there, there is one that is incredibly quicker than the other one in town. So Yeah, yeah there, there's no doubt. Um, yeah. I think I'm going to the quick one. <clears throat> the one I go to, they know me. Um, so we go pretty fast. And I'm, I'm not one of these hypochondriacs. I, I pretty much know what I have. And so I can do the, the front front loaded work for them. Okay. Fair enough. I get, I hate, I hate cause I have to get on a scale. I'll close my eyes. I like a girl. Like, don't tell me. Do you really know. tell the person not to tell you? I typically tell them, don't tell me cause it would put me in a really bad mood. Although I don't think mine, I think I'm actually down a little bit right now. Okay. Fair enough. The things you worry about head to the doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Like you don't wait like every day anyway. I don't. Do you really not? I don't. I really don't. I, it's one of my things I tried to stop because it was becoming obsessive. Okay, fair enough. And so I stopped. I, I, in fact, I can't remember the last time I got on a scale. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I mean, we could talk football. Um, I watched a little bit of Clemson, Alabama last night. Clemson rolling the tide in the national title game last night. Um, if he'd have told me that was the final score, I would have predicted Alabama to have been the victor. But frankly. Clemson, in every spot where people thought they kind of had the weakness coming in, they dominated the football game. Alabama became discombobulated. I thought, I thought I, I, we'll talk about this real quick. I, I did think that was interesting. We always talk about the Alabama machine and their composure levels. Yeah. They were popped to a point last night that they didn't understand how to respond. You know, it, it, against Georgia, I don't know if it was the style, the familiarity, what. They kind of caught themselves and picked themselves back up. Last night, there was no answer for it. It just completely continued to roll downhill once it started for Alabama. And I, I thought that was what was interesting, was there was no response. There was very little composure. There was lots of really dumb mistakes, dumb penalties. It, it, it looked like a team that was, frankly, a little scared on the field as it was kind of unraveling last night. I didn't watch it. I've, I've read about it. I, uh, I've watched the highlights, and um, I've looked at the box scores. Shout out to our boy, uh, Jeffrey Wright. He said this a long time ago. Not that it's earth-shattering. He wouldn't tell you that it's earth-shattering. If you have a big pro-style quarterback who can make throws vertically, you balance out a lot of what Alabama does well. If you have a guy who can move around and make plays and make throws, and you have athletes on the outside who can go up and, and make plays athletically, and they do, you can balance out a lot of what Alabama does on defense. You have to have a pro-style attack, in my opinion. I, you know, you look at the teams that have beaten them over the years. It's and, and Ole Miss did it a couple of times. Once with uh, with Bo Wallace and a bunch of athletes, and once with Chad Kelly's powerful right arm and a bunch of athletes. You can do it, but that's that's the that's the way you do it. You don't beat them running horizontally. Um, you don't do it with tricks and gadgets. You do it with uh, you got to be able to line up and and run it enough to keep them honest and make plays downfield in the passing game. Yeah, it's the biggest faulty narrative that you have to have some mobile quarterback that makes plays with his feet. No, he's got to have an arm. You, you you beat Alabama. I talked about the Eagles yesterday. Above the rim and down the field. Period. That's how you do it. You you throw the ball down the field and you stretch the field. If the quarterback cannot throw, you have no shot. If Look, they can no throw, you can. Look no further than Alabama, Oklahoma. Kyler Murray is an elite athlete. Elite. I mean, I don't know what his baseball numbers are, but I bet his like his speed numbers and and uh, defensive metrics and some of that stuff. I bet on that twenty eighty scale, he's in the seventies. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's an elite athlete, Jason, but he's not an elite thrower. And Alabama didn't have any problems with him. You've got to be able to stretch the field. It's it's not complicated. It's it's hard to get those kinds of players. And then, you know, give some credit here to Dabo Sweeney this year. I mean, they had a they had a quarterback coming back from a team that went to the national semifinals. Very popular on his, on his team. And uh they had Trevor Lawrence and Dabo Sweeney knew that Trevor Lawrence was better and gave his team a, a higher ceiling. And he did the right thing all all the way across the board. He uh, made the move in time that uh, is it Kelly Wright is that his name? Kelly Bryant. Kelly Bryant, where Kelly Bryant could transfer and not lose a year. Um, he did right by that kid. 
and uh, he played the best player, and, and they won. And they just went, if I got my numbers right, they just beat Notre Dame by 27 and Alabama by 28. They're 15-0. and 0. That's dominance. I mean, you can make the argument right now that over the last four years, it's, it's they and not Alabama who are the dominant program. Yeah, you know, it's it, it's funny that, I mean, now look, Clemson has recruited nothing but top-level athletes. Their entire defensive line is basically a bunch of first-round picks this year. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it is interesting to me, though, that just because they don't finish number one, it, it, it's, it's so far on this relative nature of how we feel about things, that just because they're not number one nationally in recruiting every single year, they almost have this little engine that could vibe about them, which is such crap. But it shows you what Alabama's done to everybody else, where a team that has a couple three stars starting on their team or, you know, averages that three through nine or whatever it is in the recruiting ranking, suddenly they're seen as this big time underdog. And it's fairly laughable, but it's just that Alabama of anybody but them is where we are right now. Yeah, that's fair. Um, but, you know, in the last four years now for Clemson, they've, they've won two national titles, lost a national title and lost in the semifinals. Alabama every of, time. It's a hell of a run. Um, I didn't watch it. I'm curious to see the ratings. I'm going to guess the ratings aren't good. I was a guest on Jeffrey's – Guess just Jeffrey was filling in for Eric Hasseltine yesterday, and, and he got me to come on as a guest, I think, to make fun of the Bears. And um, we were talking about – it's kind of interesting, really, and I had not thought about it, which is I'm, I'm disappointed in myself because I am an admitted Bachelor fan. ABC and ESPN are owned by the same people. ABC hyped the hell out of The Bachelor. It was a three-hour production. It was, I guarantee it got massive numbers. And why they put those, those two shows, the national championship and The Bachelor premiere, on the same night is interesting to me. I don't, I don't know whether that was basically the Disney company saying, hey, it is what it is. We're going to get who we get. We won a monopoly on Monday night. I'm a little surprised looking back that they didn't play the championship on Monday and advertise the hell out of the Bachelor throughout the game. Or just rule the world for one night with both because it's not yeah. the same. It's, well, my point is it's not the same population. The, 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 the men go in one room, the women go in the other. The women have a way to stay at home and let the guy go to the bar for the night because they're watching The Bachelor. In some ways, I thought it was kind of smart because you've got a situation where you're not – you're, you're not going after the same demographic. You, you just allow them to separate, and you give more ability for each demographic to watch their respective show last night. Yeah, I mean, I, I get that. I just kind of wonder if there was ever a strategy where they said, hey, you might get um, you might get more eyeballs on both this way. Because there's, come on, there's, I know it's, it's you surrender your man card when you say that you like the show. I get it. Trust me, there's more men out there listening to this who are, begrudgingly going, yeah, just don't tell anybody. They but, watch but, but there's the a difference in liking the show when your wife is watching it in appointment viewing for the male. You're, well, still, not, you're still not primarily going after the 18 to 35 male. No, 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 no. You're, you're watching because your wife yeah. or your... And so you can pick it up next week. It's all good. Oh, yeah. It's like a... It, in many ways, it's like college football. You can miss a couple of weeks and you don't miss much. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you know, come on. I mean, you... If I told you you can't watch college football for the month of October, it would take you one week in November to pick up what happened. You wouldn't you wouldn't miss much in reality, especially the way college football's gotten now, where it's the same programs. It's the same programs year after year after year. So much of what college football has built itself on over the years is is, you know. A, not parody, if you will, but th there's a lot of a lot of teams you can, you can sneak up and and contend and stuff. In the last four, five, six years, that's just not proven to be the case. It's the same programs every year. And you go in the next season. If you did a top three right now, top four for for right now for next year, it would be in some order: Clemson, Alabama, Georgia, and Oklahoma. It's the same programs yeah, every year. With maybe Ohio State. And maybe Ohio State. Yes, there's no. Cinderella has been ruled out in uh, in in college college football. I mean, she's gone. They they don't let her in the room. It's if, if you're not if you're not royalty, you don't get invited to the ball. Cinderella's got no chance. 
we didn't mention this, by the way, Justin Fields headed to Ohio State, so Rich gets richer, the Georgia quarterback, headed to be a Buckeye. Well, and, and this got on our board yesterday, and it was funny because I agree with it. Justin Fields has something, you know, he had that um, kind of the racial discrimination thing happen to him at a baseball game. And uh, he transferred, and Haskins, as expected, um, is leaving after his junior year to go pro, as he should. He's going to be a first-round pick. Um, Fields, I would anticipate, will petition to play be eligible immediately. Georgia, I anticipate, will fight it. NCAA's going to get put in a tough spot here. You got race, two blue blood programs. I'm fascinated to see how they rule. I have no idea. People say, what do you think? I don't know. I think the extracurricular allows them to give him eligibility. Oh, I agree with you. They, I mean, right or wrong, I feel like every time there is that extenuating circumstance, the NCAA, when it gets down to it, just kind of throws its hands up and goes, hey, do we really want to go here right now? Is this how we want to litigate? Yeah, if, if you made me bet, I'd bet that way. I agree with you. Um, it, it's, it, it's, the, it's, the, it's the folly of all the Tom Mars love at times. Yeah, look, Tom found a niche, and he's going to ride that niche. Shea Patterson was going to be eligible either way, and frankly, he didn't get eligible until Ole Miss changed some of the wording to this stupid thing. And by the way, we haven't talked about this at all because it's been a weird month. Shea Patterson going back to Michigan for his senior season. He is. What the, what the hell else was he going to do? I mean, he could have quit football. I mean, I guess he could have gone and majored in economics or something. No, he'd have been a first-round pick in Canada. Yeah. I don't think he could play in the CFL. I don't think he's got the arm to play in the CFL. You don't think he can play in the CFL? No. I mean, the, 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 the next CFL game is the first one I've seen in 10 years. So, okay, sure, I don't have any idea. But. Who do you think's better, Shea Patterson or Jeremiah Masoli? Jeremiah Masoli. There you go. Yeah. I think Shea Patterson's a poor man's Jeremiah Masoli. And I'm not ripping on Shea. I'm just not. I mean, I'm, I'm... Jeremiah's made a heck of a career in the Canadian Football League. But he had a better arm than Shea. It was every bit the athlete Shea is. Oh, Masoli was a him, weapon. And this is my point. And Jeremiah Masoli never had a chance in hell to play in the NFL. No. And so when people do this, and I'm, I'm not ma- ma- making fun of Jeremiah either. I mean, he's a, r- a really nice kid. I enjoyed covering him that year. And I, for that matter, I like Shea. His dad's insane, but I, I, I like the kid. When people do this story, he's coming back. What was what was the alternative? I used to make fun of SEC media. I swear to you, the Big Ten media is worse. Like the guys that cover Ohio State, just man, oblivious. Just they don't care. They don't care that they're glorifying an absolute criminal in in Urban Meyer. I got through listening to Gladiator. I, I listened to it on the way to and from Nashville. It's uh, done by the Boston Globe, by the Spotlight team. It's a podcast. It's really good. Thanks to all the people who recommended it to me. Part three is called Gator Nation. It's about Aaron Hernandez's time at the University of Florida. Chase, if it doesn't make your skin crawl, you 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 probably need to go see somebody because your moral compass is shot. That's Urban Meyer. Urban Meyer absolutely enabled a murderer. And they knew he was violent to the point of murder. They knew it. They covered it up. They covered it up. He was involved in a violent altercation two months after arriving to campus. He was involved in a drive-by shooting his first season. It was the day that Florida lost to Auburn to snap their winning streak. Mm Mm-hmm. He was involved in a shooting that night uh, where he shot a dude in the in the arm and the head. They knew it was him. They covered it up. In the Ohio State media, man, they just – Urban Meyer was at a basketball game the other day, and they're just tweeting pictures of him. There he is. There's Urban. It's unbelievable to me. I, it's the part of – I, I, I get so upset about it, I don't know what to do. I really do. I, 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 
you should be proud of me because I want to go on Twitter every time and go, the guy's a criminal. Are you are you that hard up for some business that 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 you you just you're going to glorify the guy? But that's the Big Ten, Michigan, Ohio State. Those programs are scum. We just talked about two programs didn't get into the entire Michigan State University. So I know didn't even touch it, and and that deals that deals the most criminal of criminal. Yeah, it's 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 abhorrent. Only the Big Ten can make Penn State look really good. I mean, from a James Franklin standpoint, I'm not going back to Sandusky or anything. I'm just talking about Franklin. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and yeah. So that's a bad league, man. I hate that league. It's funny. It's why <laughs> I like I watch it a lot because it's it's like it's on. You like the also rans of that league. You like Indiana. You like Purdue. You like Northwestern. I do like Northwestern. They finished in the top twenty five yet again. That that dude's done a really good job when you balance it all out, what he has, what he deals with, et cetera. Pat you, Fitzgerald is you, you like Iowa. Like like you, your power from like your perspective is like Wisconsin. That's like the, the, the best good team that you like. Yeah, the two teams in that league that I cheer for are mostly are Northwestern and Iowa for whatever reason. And but Northwestern, man, seriously, if you think about it pound for pound. Pat Fitzgerald's a top ten college football coach. Yeah, he's a he's a rich man's uh, or not from a program standpoint, Bill Snyder. Yeah, that's fair. Because Kansas State yeah. is a terrible program. Yeah, they don't get in trouble. They uh, they they don't recruit at a high level. They just produce. They recruit a bunch of three stars. Yeah. Uh, we'll take a break in the podcast real quick. Tell you about scripted jewelry again. If you haven't gone to the website, just head on over. Go, you'll see many things that you'll uh, you'll like. They've got sales going on right now. You can get fingerprint rings. They're called anti rings. You can get lockets with different messages on them. You script it out. They put it on the jewelry for you. The turnaround times are great. Jimmy the Elf even used it around Christmas. So plenty of things to uh, to suit you and make a gift special for that special someone. Whether it's Valentine's Day, uh, just because graduation and much more. So again, items handcrafted to order, great turnaround times, and when you buy it, tell them there are put in the coupon code REBELS10, that's R-E-B-E-L-S-1-0, and you get 10% off. Again, scriptedjewelry.com. It's really cool. You should try it. You should, the, the website's awesome. Um, anyway, the podcast also brought to you by Oxford University Bank. My voice is disappearing. Um, OUB is locally owned and operated right here in Oxford. When you deposit money at OUB, that money and the vast majority of the bank's profits go right back into the Oxford community. OUB offers its customers the absolute best cash checking accounts called Casasa. And with Casasa, OUB will pay customers 2.5% interest on their balances up to $50,000. With Casasa, ATM fees nationwide are refunded. OUB also offers online bill pay and mobile check deposit using its online app. To learn more about OUB, check out liveoxfordbankoxford.com or call 662-234-6668. OUB is FDIC insured. The podcast also brought to you by Harry Alexander. Harry's an Oxford-based REMAX legacy realty agent. He's been in Oxford more than four decades. No one knows the residential and condo market in Oxford better than Harry. Go to his site. He'll prove it to you. It's harryalexander.com. Click on the properties and neighborhoods tab. Filter through about what you're looking for and then send him an email. It's H A at harryalexander.com. Also brought to you by Grenada Nissan. Grenada Nissan located just off Interstate 55 in Grenada, Mississippi. They have a complete selection of new and previously owned Nissan vehicles. If they don't have it, they'll order it for you. They'll get it in. Uh, I've been doing business with Gene and Sandy for 11 years now. They're fantastic people. It's a great service. Great service after the sale. Uh, Everything you could want. If you are in the market for a Nissan vehicle, it's GrenadaNissanUSA.com. And we're brought to you by John Edwards of Regency Travel Incorporated in Memphis. If you've been thinking about that golf trip with the guys, the anniversary trip that she'll never forget, getting ready for your summer trip, for spring break trip, whatever it may be, get in touch with John. He's a part of Virtuoso. It's a worldwide network of travel partners that allows John to supply his clients with added values and unique benefits that are simply not available to other travelers. Give him a call. Give him some parameters. Give him a budget. He'll give you options that you would never find on your own, and you don't have to live in or near Memphis to take advantage of his services. 901-494-3387 or Edwards at regencytravel.net. First-time clients can save $50 off their first booked trip just by telling John you heard about Regency Travel. 
on the podcast. Podcast is brought to you by GM Pharmacy. And don't waste your time at the big chains. Go somewhere where you're appreciated. They're locally owned and operated, and they care about their customers. It's been Oxford's trusted hometown pharmacy for 40 years and offer many great services such as MedSync, immunizations, free delivery to your home or workplace. Conveniently located right off South Lamar Boulevard there in Oxford. Transferring your medications is simple. Again, I've done it. Just give them a call at 662 236 2222 and they will take care of the rest. You know, you, you mentioned Gladiator, and we've we, we've had this conversation a ton here, but kind of a good time to reiterate it. It's fascinating as a journalism nerd that the great work is now being done more podcast form than long form form, and frankly, it's probably more expensive. Probably takes more man hours to get the podcast done versus the really in depth feature writing. I, I guess they've decided that more people listen than read, and that's how they want to distribute information because it takes an extra talent. It takes tons of extra people. But you're seeing that Pulitzer-level work from newspapers much more in podcast form than you are the big you know, tab, expose kind of stuff in the written word. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? Um, and I've listened to a bunch of like podcasts and stuff over the last, as you have, um, you know, uh, the Tennessean, um, now the, the Boston Globe, there's, there's a lot of these, uh, these kind of publications that are, um, that are doing that. And, and it's, it's excellent work. It really is. It's, I mean, it was, it, it took a, that drive to Nashville, which isn't a bad drive. Um, it just made it walk in the park. I mean, I looked up, I was in Nashville. I was just listening to his eight part, I guess it was seven or eight part series. I listened to the whole thing on the way there and back. And, um, it's really, really good. And you're right. No one's doing the long form writing much anymore other than the athletic. Um, and it's far more expensive to produce a podcast like that. So you're right. It's good point. I hadn't even really thought about it like that, but you're right. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we had her on the show. I mean, even locally, Emma Kent doing the Lee Ochi stuff. I mean, everybody, I don't know. It's just, it's, it, it's all the way around the country. And I, I guess there's a reason behind it. I mean, you can, frankly, you can sell ads in it. You can, uh, you can sign a start a, a network, if you will, with it as well. So, I mean, I would, I would be interested to see how it comes about in some of those areas, but there's no doubt it's, it's more part podcast form than anything else, uh, any else currently. So we're, uh, we're going to have Jay in a second, uh, again, since we're online and we're just going to go to him and, uh, we'll start talking immediately, but Neil Ole Miss and, uh, in Auburn tomorrow night, I, I kind of, ex- I, I kind of, a um, uh, kind of expect a pretty good crowd I, I think that they will uh fill it up especially for a wednesday with kids out of town probably about as good as you can get in oxford for a midweek game late yesterday i was told that uh the lower bowl is sold out in the upper bowl i think there was someone said 800 tickets left um you know it's a wednesday it's middle of the week obviously it's the wednesday uh 6 p.m makes it easier to get home maybe a little harder to get there i think it's i think you're gonna get a better crowd at six than you would have gotten at eight no doubt um but yeah i think if it's not a complete sellout it's going to be really really close it's six eight. o'clock it's the no-brainer for the guy from tupelo you know what i mean that that, oh, kind, yeah. that kind of drive that, oh yeah done we'll be oh, home yeah. by nine yeah a home and and um completely settled in by 10 o'clock where you can go to bed and get a decent night's sleep before you have to get up and and go to work on Thursday. If you live in Jackson, you can still do it. If you live in Memphis, it's an easy call. Those 8 o'clock games, I realize that they're for TV. But, the, man, those 8 o'clock games are just killers for people. Because if you live in, say you live in Madison, and that game starts at 8, by the time you get to your car, it's 1045, you're, you're 1 in the morning getting home. Yeah, every bit of it. Hard to do that when the game's on TV in HD, and you can watch on on your 70-inch. And uh, be in bed by ten thirty. That's it's hard to get someone to pull the trigger on that. Let's uh let's go ahead and call Jay now. Everybody will hear him come in. Let's see, J G Tate. There is J G Tate. Let's call J G Tate. It's supposed to be ringing, so we'll see. Jay? Are you there? Hello? Okay, he did not I'm answer. Still here with you. Yeah, you're still here. He did not answer. So I will try him again in a second. That's the beauty of live. Uh... 
It's good pod. It's fine. It's good pod. No one cares. Let's see. Let's try it one more time. It is uh it is trying to ring. Did you piss him off on G Pits this week where he's not gonna come into the call? I don't think so. Okay. I think he's I think he's happy with me. Yeah, he just still did not come into the call. I'll text him real quick and make sure there's not a problem. Okay. Go ahead and do that. This is uh, we mentioned this yesterday. This is Auburn's SEC opener. They've uh, played pretty well for the most part. So he is now online. I have a oh, click next to his name. So let's try that again. He uh, he must not. It, I, I did not have a little green signal, so I was calling early. It appears. One thing I've learned about Jay when he says eight thirty, he means eight thirty. He does not mean eight twenty nine. He means eight thirty. I mean eight thirty. You mean eight thirty? He is. He is the most punctual person I've ever met when it comes to like specific times. I called you at eight twenty eight, Jay, and I did not get a response. Well, the fuck, it wasn't eight thirty. <laughs> Fair. Go. I thought you. I thought Neil had already pissed you off or something. You were. You. Were... Oh, he, he's really not capable of pissing me off, honestly. After all this time, you've never been pissed off at him ever. I mean, I'm not in the last ten years. I mean, I, he's, I'm kind of past that point. Okay. Fair enough. He's my guy. Did you have a good time in uh, Memphis? I haven't talked to I you. did. I don't know as though he did, but I did, yeah. Why did he not? Well, I can't answer that for you, but what I can tell you is that he seemed distracted the whole time, which is fine, whatever. We all got shit going on. Are you still here, Neil, or are you gone? I'm listening. Okay. I'm listening. Well, you said you were, you were leaving for a second, so. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm about to go gargle some salt water when y'all start talking basketball. Okay. He's sick, Jay. But you're sick. Yeah, I'm sick, but I'm I'm gonna go get well here in just a minute. All right. Yeah. While he's do, while he's doing that, we'll uh, we'll talk a little basketball. Jay Auburn's SEC opener is in Oxford on Wednesday night. It looks like they've uh, played pretty well. What's uh, what's sort of the state of things headed into conference play? Man, it's been a minute. I mean, they haven't played a game since December 29th, and uh, sheesh, it's been a while. That wasn't a very good game either. They played North Florida, and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They won by like 50. Uh, this team, they've got a little bit of everything, man. Uh, they finally kind of uh, brought together all the visions that Pearl had as far as what he was going to do at Auburn. He's got his shot blockers in Austin Wiley and Anthony McLemore. He's got some shooters in Jared Harper and Bryce Brown. He's got kind of a do-everything three now in Samir Downey. And he's got a good bench. Really, he's 10 deep at this point with Daniel Purifoy. He used to be a starter here before he got into trouble. Uh, he's a 10th guy now. So they've got depth, they've got height, they've got shooting. Uh, if there's one thing they don't have, it's that their rebounding kind of comes and goes despite having some pretty good rebounders. I'm not exactly sure how you explain that. And their three-point defense is kind of eh, comes and goes. So I don't know. It's a pretty good team, man. They've been in the top 10, I think, the whole way so far, uh, outside of maybe one week after they lost at NC State. Uh, but they've been pretty good. I will say this. I was at practice yesterday, and they – uh, Bruce Pearl has a specific issue with Kermit insofar as he thinks Kermit is a really good coach. Uh, I've seen him prepare for a lot of people. And the warnings that he was giving his team yesterday about the things that Ole Miss is going to do, uh, they, they were more stern than normal. He's got a, Bruce has got a lot of respect for Kermit. Yeah, Kermit's had a pretty bit, good bit of success. Uh, I, and I guess it has a lot to do, you know, mostly with defense. Everybody talks about Kermit's 1-3-1 and some of those different things. But this Ole Miss team, it was kind of a, not an argument, but it was a conversation on our message board yesterday. They're winning with offense because they're still kind of learning that 1-3-1. It's what Andy ran, too, but it was sort of a copy of Kermit's system. And Kermit runs it probably a little more disciplined and different things. So I'm, this is probably the, the worst defensive team that Kermit's going to have at Ole Miss just from a personnel standpoint. So that's why I'm kind of interested in tomorrow night. Yeah, but that one three one with uh, the wings that he's got. I mean, uh, here's here's the deal. Ole Miss. I mean, Tyree Davis, Schuler. Uh, those are three of probably the six best guards in the whole league. And Auburn feels like it has the best guards too. So I mean, it's coming. This is going to be a great guard game, and I think there's a lot of respect uh, for what Ole Miss can do personnel wise. And I know they're just getting to know exactly the way Kermit wants to run his one three one, but they've got the personnel to do it. And they have really been doing a nice job. I mean, I, I, Auburn's got a—they got their hands full with this one, and they know it. And Pearl knows it, so uh, it's going to be an interesting game for sure. I, I have a lot of respect for uh, the way Ole Miss has played Auburn these last, let's say, five years. I mean, Andy really owned mm. Auburn a while there, and Auburn broke through a little bit last year. But I don't know. Ole Miss has been really good in Oxford against Auburn through the years. 
Auburn's only been on the road once for a true road game at NC State, but they played pretty dang well, losing 78-71 to a top-15 team. So it's not like it uh, it was some problem for them. They had all the neutral site stuff out in Hawaii. I mean, it's a it's a fairly battle-tested team for a team that hadn't really been on the true road. Yeah, I mean, the NC State game was kind of weird. They just abandoned some things they don't normally do. and And there's a specific issue there where when a team – schemes Auburn defensively to take away Bryce Brown, and that's their their number two guard, their three-point shooter. He loves set shots. And if you make him move all the time, or better, make him drive, it just seemed there was a time there in early December where they they got real panicky. Uh, UAB was really good about getting that specifically taken away, and then Auburn got panicky and had to win that game in overtime. NC State was able to take Bryce away, and they lost that game 78-71. But I thought, you know, Murray did some of that, too. Murray's a good team, I think. Uh, they've had some issues. I don't think they'll have many more. Uh, they took away Bryce, but then Auburn was okay. Even though Auburn won that game by five, I thought Auburn had good command of that game. They, they're kind of learning what to do when Bryce gets taken out. And they've got the players to do it. It's just they hadn't done it before, and they're starting to learn to trust some of these other guys and what you do when Bryce can't give you 25 points a game. Ole Miss, obviously, you mentioned the guards, but in the post, it's a it's a struggle. They've got some young kids that play the three and the four pretty well, but as far as the actual overall forwards, it's it, it's been a bit of a mess with Dominic Olenicek and Bruce Stevens. How is Auburn going to kind of counteract that? Because they're going to be much better in the post tomorrow than Ole Miss. Yeah, they're going to have to feed Austin Wiley. Austin Wiley is an incredibly efficient scorer in the post. Uh, he's a six eleven. Some people call him seven feet. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> Uh, but he's really good when they get him the ball. Auburn was built kind of to transition. And the way Bruce Pearl's been doing things here for the last 15 years is he tries to get – he was kind of on the forefront of this positionless basketball movement, and he loves for his center to be able to get out and transition and do some guard things. He was doing that back at Tennessee. You know, Austin's not that guy. Austin's kind of an old-school, back-to-the-basket type of player. So he kind of sticks out in that way, and they've got to think – get the ball inside to Austin. They have to change everything they do to get him the ball. I mean, if his name was Austin Smith and he didn't have two parents who played basketball at Auburn, he probably wouldn't be at Auburn. He'd be somewhere else like Duke or North Carolina. Uh, he's that good. But they have to kind of think, they have to break from protocol to get the ball to him. And they're going to have to do that at Ole Miss because that's a huge advantage for them. Uh, I don't think the white dude is going to be able to really uh, mess with Austin very much in there defensively. I don't, I'm not going to try to uh, pronounce his name, but number 13. Yeah, Dom, Dominic Olenichik. Yeah, the Ole Miss's post defense is going to get challenged. It's been it's been it's been this major <clears throat> major negative for them, and and really, you know, the college game is such that there aren't a whole lot of programs necessarily who can take advantage of it. Vanderbilt did to some degree, but that kid's so young, and, and he's uh, Simasola Shatu. He's young and he's thin and. He's going to be a really good player one day, but right now he's still pretty raw. But Wiley's going to give them fits if Auburn's committed to, to doing it. But like you said, that's kind of – when you think about Bruce Pearl basketball, that's not really what you think of. You don't think about them pounding the ball inside. You think about them playing fast. That's right. And the thing is, okay, so Auburn defensively, they're going to have to be very careful with these Ole Miss guards because the Kermit's going to be creative with them, and they're really good, and they're experienced. They know what they're doing. The thing is, I think Auburn's first team guys can handle the defensive assignments that they're going to deploy. I mean, Auburn's been playing a little bit more zone this year than they had before. They used to be just man-to-man, and I think they were getting exposed a little bit, particularly late in the year last year. So they've kind of learned how to switch from zone to man-to-man within a possession. I just don't think their second team guys can run that stuff. Um, Having watched them fail at it in games and also in practice to get scolded for messing up assignments when they're switching from zone to man, I think if Ole Miss can somehow get the first team guys into foul trouble, specifically Jared and Bryce, the two guards, I think they can take better advantage of Auburn defensively. I think Ole Miss is going to score points in this game, but I just don't think those second team guys for Auburn can get their act together. I think they'll have to play straight man against Ole Miss with the second team guys, and that is definitely to Ole Miss's advantage. Tell me this, Jay, because I'm looking at this, if you agree. I think this is the game that's kind of the tipping off point for Auburn into a really hot start in league play when I look at these first five, six games because they've got Georgia at home. They go to A&M. A&M's not played very well. They've got Kentucky at home. Kentucky's not normal Kentucky right now. And then at South Carolina, I mean, tomorrow might be their most difficult game out of the first five before they take a road trip to Mississippi State. 
Yeah, I think it's one or two. You know, Kentucky, you think, oh, gosh, Kentucky. But Auburn's been pretty good against Kentucky lately, and it's not hard for Pearl to get them up for that game. But South Carolina, it sounds weird, but they're just so mean and physical the way they play. <laughs> Auburn's kind of a finesse team, and they don't match up well with South Carolina. Uh, and then Mississippi's got the guards that are going to really mess with Auburn's depth. So those two teams specifically uh, cause Auburn problems in ways that other teams don't. Dude, Ole Miss is good. Uh, they were picked, what, last in the league? Dead last. Yeah, they're picked dead last. Yeah, they're, they're not going to finish last. They're going to finish in the middle or top half, somewhere in there. Uh, they're, they're just too good at guard, assuming they don't get anybody injured. Yeah, they're thin. Um, yeah. But they they... they Right now, there are a number of things. It's 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 funny because they're they're what happens. Last season could not have gone worse for them in terms of just kind of. It's gonna sound corny, but in terms of like from a morale standpoint, from a a team spirit standpoint, they 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 hated the season by the time that season ended, and uh, this this team is a new coach and. They've bought in because it's kind of one of those deals. Well, why not? You know, I mean, yeah. why not just give it a shot? And and as it has started to work, uh, they have fun. I mean, they 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 dominated the last eight minutes because you and I texted a little bit during that Ole Miss Vanderbilt game. At, at the point where you texted me, it was like, man, this game is dead even. And I was like, yeah, it's exactly. I mean, the two teams are are exactly the same right now. And then Ole Miss dominated those last eight and a half minutes. It was a big confidence booster for them. They'll have a big crowd and. It's a, I think Ole Miss goes into this week. They've got Auburn and Mississippi State, two teams that are top 15 in the country, two teams that if the if the tournament were seeded today, that they'd be no worse than four seeds, and uh, maybe threes. And um, you know they've got a chance because of the the fact that they won at Vanderbilt, and the fact that they generally took care of of what they were supposed to take care of in the preseason or in the in the non-league part of the season. They win one of these two games. Like if let's say they beat Auburn tomorrow night, they wake up on Thursday morning. You know, their their season has begun to take on a different tone. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, State's going to be a problem. Uh, they they've gotten a whole lot better, maybe quicker than Auburn actually, because they were just absolutely balls. What like two years ago with Auburn? No, oh, it was more like four years ago. Yeah, they like, were bad. Yo, they were horrible, and Auburn was worse. I was covering a worse team. For Ole Miss, it's just going to be how many of these teams have big dudes that can go for 20. I mean, Chateau showed you the other night what he can do, uh, and he's a young guy. I mean, LSU's got the the big center that Ole Miss is going to have trouble defending. Uh, Alabama's really big. Ole Miss will have trouble with them. Yeah, we, We'll see what Austin Wiley can do. He has great games and bad games. He's got to get fed because sometimes they just forget about him. What's that- interesting about Ole Miss with their post guys is that their best post defender is the freshman, Buffin. Uh, Ola Nitschik actually did some decent things down the stretch. Um, the last five, six minutes of the game against uh, Chateau, he actually kind of solidified their their post defense enough for them to pull it off. And then Stevens has just been awful on the defensive end. I mean, just really getting played off the floor, frankly, to the point that if you know they had another another post body, I don't know how much he'd play. And I mean, he's he's fallen in love with this pick and pop three point shot and he never makes it and it's uh he doesn't give him much i don't know what his plus minus was the other night but it, it certainly felt like when he was on the floor he was a, a major liability this is bruce stevens yeah mm, I, I mean offensively he's pretty good but you're right on the defensive end particularly in the vanderbilt game i was like oh god he was getting run by in ways that only uh number 13 i i thought he played a lot tougher in that game yeah he he did not start out well in the game against Vanderbilt, but he actually had a really good second half. Um, when you go back and kind of look at it, he, like I said, he kind of solidified their, they want him because look, he's limited, right? He's not a super athlete. He's a big, but he's a really big body. And they just kind of want him to be a presence at the rim to just kind of anchor the defense a little bit. And, uh, a lot of times teams will move the ball around and, and he gets out of position. He gets kind of caught watching, but in terms of, uh, He's a smart kid. He's certainly trying to do it the right way. With, with with Stevens, there's just there's kind of an inability on his part so far to, I think, to buy into what they're trying to do defensively. He just kind of wants to play, and then he wants to shoot. And uh, the Buffin kid's a freshman. He's going to be a really good player at Ole Miss. 
as early as next season. Right now, his problem, and it'll be a problem for him against Wiley. Right now, his problem is he's just not strong enough. He gets kind of pushed around a little bit, and he held his own against Chateau, but Chateau's a lot taller than him. Um, he, he has got a chance. I mean, they've it'll be it's going to be a fun game. I I don't know what all the Ken Palm analytics and stuff have the game, but I sort of anticipate a game that is is undecided with four minutes left. Mm. You've been Ken sitting Palm. around watching a lot of Ole Miss, Jay. You seem to be a little well versed in this topic. Well, just because Bruce has kind of a thing for Kermit, uh, you know, when I talk to him privately, he's just, you know, because Bruce used to be on ESPN, so I think he keeps more of an eye on the SEC than your average coach. And so when I say, hey, you know, what's going on in the SEC, he'd be like, man, you see what Kermit's doing? They would pick to finish last. That ain't going to happen, you know, that kind of stuff. And so we talk about it a little bit more. But I was at home watching the Vandy uh, Ole Miss game, so I was texting with Neil, and I was just kind of keeping a close eye on what was going on there. And Tyree went off that game, and I wasn't expecting that. No, he went off. It was his, that was the best offensive game I've ever seen from him. He, he's playing with, uh, he's playing with a, a different level of confidence right now. He he is he has benefited from coaching change more than anybody inside that program. Absolutely, yeah. his, his defensive game has to come along a little bit more. But but um, he's got a really good. Kermit talked about it after the game. He's got a really good mid range game. He can get to the rim, and now he's he's shooting the three with. Uh, I don't know what his percentages are, but he's shooting the three pretty effectively. And when you can score at three levels, especially at the college game, you're really tough to defend. Took a break in this conversation to tell you about Bastard Cut 662-607-7773. It is time to go ahead and get those contracts ready for the year. Let Master Cuts take care of your lawn and landscaping all of 2019. They've been handling mine for several years now and they can make sure you have a yard looking up to par as well or if you're still needing something for the little one after christmas remember they do playgrounds that will entertain your kids for years to come from forts to princess castles to pirate ships let master cuts build a base for your child's imagination to run wild reach out and schedule a free meeting and see what master cuts can do for you that's info at gomastercuts.com or 662-607-7773 Fresh off an SEC road victory over Vanderbilt, the 11-2 and two Ole Miss men's hope, hoops teams uh, ret- returns to the pavilion on Wednesday as they host number 12 Auburn at 6 p.m. The first 1,000 fans will receive an Ole Miss basketball replica jersey. Limited tickets remain and can be purchased by visiting OleMissTicks.com. Ole Miss baseball season right around the corner. Season tickets start at just $150 to purchase. Visit OleMissTicks.com and the Ole Miss women's hoops team back in action on Thursday night at 7 p.m. as they take on the LSU Tigers. Tickets can be purchased by visiting OleMissTicks.com. The uh, podcast also brought to you by Home Two Suites in Oxford. It's open and uh, ready for you to stay with them in 2019. Coming to Oxford to watch Rebel Hoops at the Pavilion, Home Two Suites is conveniently located one mile from campus. Uh, just off the old Taylor Road exit, they're offering a 20% discounted rate the entire week of Pop-Up Oxford. That's January 19th through the 26th. You must call the front desk to receive the discount when booking. It's a pet-friendly hotel, so you do not have to leave your four-legged friends behind. And they have a designated area for walks complete with the pet store for your convenience. Be sure to follow them on social media so you don't miss their announcement for when football weekend reservations will open. Step into the new year in style. You really need to experience the difference a quality sock makes. This is the first step in dressing for the job you want, not the job you have. Go to deadsoxy.com uh, and enter the code REBELGROVE at checkout to receive 25% off all orders, including sale items. As they continue to grow, they want you to know they appreciate the continued support of the Rebel Grove community. They're constantly striving to improve their quality, their relationships, and their customer experience. And you'll be the first to learn of all new products and opportunities as they come. So remember to enter promo code REBELGROVE at checkout for 25% off all orders at deadsoxy.com. And guests like Jay Tate, join us on the Patterson and Earhart hotline. Patterson and Earhart attorneys at law specialize in personal injury law and real estate law but theirs is a general practice that can handle any of your legal needs. When you contact Patterson and Earhart, you speak to one of the partners in the firm, and that's who will handle your case, not some paralegal at a faceless corporate firm. If Patterson and Earhart can't help you, they'll refer you to someone who can. John Calvin Patterson and Wes Earhart are Ole Miss guys. They're local guys, and when you call them, you're going to get one of them on the phone within the same day, guaranteed. 
So whether you've been injured in a wreck or have other legal issues, give them a call, 662-526-1992, or check out their website, pelaws.com. Your initial consultation is free. Neil mentioned Ole Miss basketball on January 26th for the Iowa State game. That's going to be when you can meet the Ole Miss baseball team. That's a part of Pop-Up Oxford. You can see the full list of events at popupoxfordms.com. That's January 19th through 27th. Everything from basketball to community reading, a songwriter's competition, hotel hop, and much more. MLK Day breakfast, movies at the Belfry. Everything you would like to experience off Oxford that week, again, January 19th through 27th. You see the full calendar of events at popupoxfordms.com. Now back to JT. Well, Auburn is very concerned about this. and uh, If they can get them down to the second team, guys, I think it's going to be man on man, and I, I think they can take advantage from an old Miss perspective. Auburn's got to go inside, and they got to accentuate their length and their height because they have some, and they can be they can tower over Ole Miss. They just kind of have to think about it because it doesn't come naturally to them to do that. The uh, the bunker enjoy the national title game last night. Oh yes, absolutely wonderful, man. <laughs> a bit surprising, huh? Good it was God. a little surprising. Yeah, wasn't wasn't expecting that one. No nah, hell no. I uh, I told Neil yeah. earlier in the day Alabama looked more discombobulated I've ever seen them. They just never really had an answer and seemed kind of undisciplined, frankly, for the most of the game last night. I had the late hits and yeah, silliness. I had to see them encroaching defensively. They never do that. And, and I, I just felt like in the second half, all that stuff was going wrong, and Saban was just kind of like folding his arms, going, "Damn." <laughs> be some busy, uh, busy repo man. And uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm about, kidding, to- totally kidding. It's, it's, yeah. Those those young men are not not receiving any extra benefits. I used to be so rustled by Dabo, I really did. He, I used to just be so rustled by him because I thought it was all fake. But now, man, he's been doing this so long. I think it's really his Dabo like this. You know, he's just kind of weird. And goofy, but I was happy to see him win. It's good. I did read a story on Yahoo, I think it was, that said that Clemson has now replaced Alabama as the preeminent powerhouse of college football, and I don't agree with that statement. I think those two are hand-in-hand hand at this point. I don't think that Clemson has overtaken Alabama in a general sense. I mean, in this season, yes, but I think... We, talk, uh, we talked about this kind of going at the beginning of the show. It's it's They've got over the last four years, they've won two national championships, lost a national championship, and lost in the semifinals. They've they're, they've finished their season against Alabama four times now. They've won two and lost two. They're they're awfully damn consistent. But yeah, I mean now that you know, like it's those two programs, and then it's, it's what I think is kind of the I don't and I don't know that maybe this is not bad for college football. I don't know. You tell me. Go in the next season. If I offered you Alabama, Clemson, or the field, you would take Alabama, Clemson. You wouldn't even think about taking the field, right? That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Why not? I mean, that's they, not good. That's not. I don't think that's particularly good for a sport. I don't. I don't think it matters. These other teams are going to click. They'll catch up eventually. I mean, it's not going to take too long. I'll tell you what, I'm going to be very intrigued with the Auburn Tigers next year. I know your folks who have been listening said, yeah, JG, I heard this before, but Auburn's gotten everybody back. Derek Brown, who I thought was going to be a first-round pick, is coming back. Uh, their left tackle, Prince Tega, who I thought was going to go to the NFL, maybe like a third-round pick, he's coming back. I believe Marlon Davidson is going to be coming back. He's probably a second- or third-round pick. All three of those guys I thought were going to be gone you know, two months ago for sure. And Gus is going to go all in doing it his way, right? Yeah, I mean, he's calling the plays now, and he has a coordinator, but he's actually 28 years old. So he's like kind of a consultant more than anything. And I mean, assuming they get the good quarterback play out of this five-star super-duper badass they got freshman coming in, I mean, they, they might be pretty good, and we'll see. Uh, this year kind of humbled me as a picker because I thought they were going to be good, and they absolutely pooped the bed. But they're going to have a lot of dudes back on defense, that's for sure, and you think Gus is going to get his head out uh, on offense and get them straightened out. They're going to be pretty good. Their opener might be the most intriguing opener of the year, of, of anybody in the country. Yeah, they've got Oregon and yeah. Jerry World, and uh, you know Justin Herbert is coming back, so yeah. I mean, Oregon's gonna be good. It's gonna be pretty good. What's that? Yeah, what's that pregame uh, speech gonna sound like, Jay? Man, it's gonna be a big game out there. I mean, you got the leg guts out there. We gotta win this ball game. Oregon's pretty good, but uh, I'll tell you what, let's fly, War Eagle. Let's <laughs> fly. By that. <laughs> Jacobs is still here to give one. Boys, I'm going to pray for you this whole game. 
We're going to feel it. We're going to feel that, that flesh. Comes a winning football game. Poor Eagle. Pray for you the whole game. <laughs> I'm not mocking praying, by the way. I'm just mocking right. that Jake just made praying like an Auburn thing. Like nobody else prays except all. Hey, Auburn. what happened at the Music City Bowl? Nobody, uh, nobody tweeted out the pregame prayer oval. Is that true? No one did it. I looked for I'm it. Just, it's almost it, disappointing. I got there a little bit late. You might expect. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm Purdue game. Mm. Yeah, there was no no pregame prayer oval tweet. Talk about a game I didn't expect, or you know, a result that I didn't expect. Auburn absolutely. Absolutely blowing whose doors off. I, I mean, I knew Purdue, Purdue was kind of, you know, average, but good golly. Dude, they set the, the record for most points scored in a half of a of a bowl ever, anywhere. Yeah, Any- they destroyed them. I mean, it's kind of what I thought. I mean, it was, it was like it was like Gus Malzahn's preseason statement of we're going to do it my way. And if I'm him, I've gambled on myself to this point. I mean, he's, right. he's going to get a ton of money no matter what. I'm going to go do it my way. Yeah. What an incredible story, though, all those people lining up to fire him. <laughs> he just goes, no, I'd rather coach and get $32 million. But it starts up, I mean, if they lose to Oregon, it starts up right away. Uh, right? Absolutely. There's no doubt. I mean, it's every loss now is going to be fire him. Let's go. Let's go fire him. Fire his ass. I mean, he's, there's people that are still doing it right now. They just don't like him. They think he's bad for the program. And it's not because he does bad things, aside from losing. I mean, he, I know this, he, is nope. a, this is a hot take, I know, but given the way that Alabama went down last night, is there any – you have any sense at all that that's a, the, the, a sign of a chink in the armor or is it just a bad night? Uh, I think it was just a bad night. But we knew all along that Alabama's defense was not up to Alabama par, right? I mean, I, I never felt like that team's identity had to do with its defense. And it was just a, merely a good defense rather than a excellent – as you would expect from Alabama defense. So they got up against a team that was big and well-drilled and good, and they gave up a whole lot of points. So the story to me wasn't that they gave up 40-plus to uh, Clemson. It was that they couldn't score. I mean, that offense was insane this year. And they finally had dudes that up front that could rush the quarterback and pressure Tua without them having to compensate with blitzes and, and leave him too many open receivers. So they were able to get to him just enough. And I don't, some of the calls in that game, I mean, I know the fake field goal is one thing, but they had one down near the goal line. It was like fourth and three or something, or maybe it was fourth and goal from the three. And they run like a quarterback sweep with Tua. Like, what the hell was that? He's the slowest guy on the field, including the refs. And he got stopped for a loss, turnover. Thinking to myself, what are y'all doing? I mean, it happens, man. I've, believe me, I've seen a lot of those plays covering Auburn. Because they took a huge jump this year, strategically, but... You don't normally see that from my old them. What time are you coming over tomorrow? During the daytime? I don't know. Probably, I'd like to try to get there about 4 and uh, hang out and then uh, go cover this game. <laughs> I forgot to get credentials, too. Fortunately, Auburn interceded on my behalf. and uh, so I, I totally forgot about that. Kind of an important part of the process. Yeah, you kind of need the credentials to get in. It'll be my first time at, uh, covering a game there. Now, are you still down on the floor taking pictures, or do you come up and sit with the peons? Uh, I was hoping it was all in the same, but no. I can do both, really. Oh, gotcha. I know I'm asking you. Can I do both? I don't know. I, I mean, I would assume I would assume you can. I mean, you can go sit with the photographer people down on the baseline and take pictures with your little camera and then come up later, I guess. I do like doing that because I can hear, and there's a lot to hear, particularly when you're uh, near the LSU sideline, you know, when they come to Auburn because uh, – their coach has a potty mouth. Oh, uh, Wade does? Well, oh, my goodness, yes. Really? I, I don't know as I've ever heard a coach talk as much junk to his team as that guy did last year. Good golly. And, I mean, I've covered some mean dudes. I covered Patino for three years. They must have a history of that thing because John Brady was kind of the, the champion of that over the years. <laughs> the most miserable human being I've ever covered. <laughs> Neil and I was a joke about it. Mean. That guy was just angry all the time. And he's put upon by the NCA right now. We we pissed off Kent Lowe that day. We said, "What's he do for Christmas? Send everybody a cobra." <laughs> <laughs> he got so mad. I meant the snake. Yeah. Yeah. God, that guy's miserable. I hope he's happier now, at least a little bit. I talked to him last year when people thought he was going to be on Kermit's staff, and he he seemed much happier, much more laid back. That's good. Age, age had had mellowed him. 
Yeah, and money, hopefully. Made a little bit, put a little bit away. Make you feel a little bit better. Well, he sure was bad back in the day, they say, on the SEC teleconference. Remember that? He hung up on it one time. No, I don't remember that, but I'm not surprised. I, I can remember being near their their bench at a, I guess at a tournament game, and man, he was he was uh, he was entertaining. I wish that I had taped what Wade was saying last year uh, to his team at Auburn because it was absolutely incredible. I want to get it right. I I just I would like to get it word for word. Was it a lot of expletives, or was he just going after the? the- oh no, it was definitely expletives. The stuff that I would want to say on the show. Yeah. But I'll see you privately. It was it was bad. <laughs> I, mean, I respect him because I would have said the same thing. But you know, I don't know. He's in the middle of an arena. I mean, <laughs> there's people sitting right there. I mean, there's probably some moms and sisters. Yeah, it's fun to listen to the smart coaches. Like listening to AK was fun because it was so sarcastic, as you can imagine. Yes. Now nah, I've was- heard that Kermit feels the paint. I haven't had a chance to sit close enough to hear it yet. But well, I'll probably be sitting by them. So. See, you have to give me the report. Mm-hmm. All right, I'll see you guys up there. All right, Jay, be careful. Later, bud. And Mr. Tate's gone. Uh, all right. Um, let's see. Make sure he's gone. You're still here, Neil. I'm assuming. I am with you. You are here. I am here uh, in body and to some degree in spirit. I did not realize he was coming over tomorrow. Yes. Traveling for an Ole Miss midweek game. Yeah, I helped him book a room. Um, Does he typically do that, or is it just because of uh, connections and commonality here? uh, I think he travels a good bit, and they're really good. Um, You know, it's probably a team that, barring something crazy, is making the tournament. And um, they're like every other fan base. If the basketball team's really good, they get into basketball. Speaking of uh, that a little bit before we go into a uh, in, in a break in a second, I've got it up. Hold on. Had it up somewhere. Where is it? Here we go. The uh, the new net came out yesterday, actually right after we got off air. So I had some so, some numbers that became obsolete quickly. They were not incorrect. They were just obsolete it, quickly. It happens. Um, it does. Ole Miss up to 36 in the net as of right now. That is uh, in pretty good position. Auburn all- is going to be at number 14, and the big jump is after the win over Kansas. Iowa State jumped from 30th to 13th in the net yesterday. Wow. And what's Mississippi State right now? Mississippi State is sitting at 19 in the net right now. Boy, I tell you what, January is full of opportunities. Opportunities everywhere. Um, some good opportunities at home as well. And, you uh, again, you just kind of look at it. I mean, they're in really good shape. I mean, after – I mean, I get some of these teams are a little down compared to where they relatively are or where they normally are. But Ole Miss in the same company net-wise at the moment as Cincinnati, Villanova, Iowa, Minnesota, Murray State's a really good program, Kansas State, Syracuse, Alabama, Washington, Florida, Clemson, Butler. Yep. That point guard for Murray State. So. Woo. Ole Miss is 21 spots ahead of Butler in the net right now. Just fun fact for the day. It's probably a game they wish they had back. Yeah. As crazy as it sounds now, um, if they probably had played with well, the Well, because they had the lead most of the day. They frankly played better for 35 minutes. Yeah, they, they didn't know how to finish that game. Um, first, first year stuff, you know. For, Cincinnati a, all the way down to 34 after losing to East Carolina on Saturday. That is a brutal loss. Just ugly. Yeah, just one of those killers. Uh, Tennessee leads the SEC. They are sixth overall in the net currently. Yeah, they're special. They're good. They they really have no they have no real weakness to speak of. Like you know how you can you can pick a team apart a little bit. Um, they're hard to pick apart. They're they're they don't do anything incredibly, but they do nothing badly. Hell, they don't do anything average. They're just good across the board. Key for Ole Miss tomorrow night is going to be hanging in on the glass, not giving up those second chance opportunities, um, not having those defensive lapses late in the shot clock, and then making Auburn defend. That's where I kind of give Ole Miss a real chance. Ole Miss's guard play is going to make Auburn defend. 
in a way that Auburn really hasn't had to defend since they played Duke. But Auburn's good. I mean, Auburn's good. I mean, they're really good. I mean, you could, Ole Miss could play well tomorrow night. Ole Miss could play really well tomorrow night and lose. Auburn's that good. Yeah, I'm incredibly interested about tomorrow. We'll uh, continue that in one second. First day, the podcast brought to you part by Community Mortgage, Oxford, Memphis, Soto County, and Chattanooga. Underwriting and processing is done in Memphis. You're getting local underwriting and understands your market, a leader in condo financing, and the float down option. You can find Jason at 662-234-2704 or JLO, that's J-L-O-W-E, at communitymtg.com. Um, the podcast also brought to you in part by the Weston Jackson. Restore serenity to your soul. Visit Soul Spa, the ultimate luxury spa experience in downtown Jackson. Indulge in personalized massages, signature facials, soothing body treatments, and much more on their extensive spa list. Escape from the everyday and rejuvenate yourself in their luxury spa today. And then gather at Estelle Wine Bar and Bistro. Sip on a creative craft cocktail or enjoy their curated wine list. It's open for breakfast, lunch dinner and Sunday brunch, Chef Caden's mission is to connect guests with the community through local partnerships. So gather at Estelle tonight. The podcast is also brought to you by Pinnacle Trust. Pinnacle Trust is based in Madison, Mississippi, represents clients in 24 states, has advisors in three states. It's also part of the Pinnacle Trust 401k advisory services. Maintaining an appropriate retirement plan for your company often seems like a daunting task, especially when you consider Everything that goes into running a successful business, the Pinnacle Trust 401k advisory services provides plan sponsors with the expertise and consultation that they need to administer a retirement plan that inspires employees to reach their retirement goals. Pinnacle Trust uh, retirement plan advisory specializes in a variety of different types of plans, including 401k plans, 403b plans. When you work with Pinnacle Trust Advisory Services, you gain a valuable advisory team and time-saving resource that will help you develop and maintain a solid strategy for your retirement plan. They're committed to providing you with the personalized attention and involvement that you want and need. Their goal is to help you manage your 401k plan properly and ultimately improve your employees' retirement readiness. Check them out at pintrust.com. That's P-I-N-N trust.com. Sorry, I was looking at something. I'll tell you in a minute that uh, you'll get a kick out of, but probably can't do it at the uh, at the moment. Anyway, I don't know. Sorry. No problem. I got really, really distracted there for a second. That's okay. It is. Uh, before we move on, let me tell you about the Blow Dry Bar Oxford. Been telling you about it for a while. Get that special someone in your life a gift card, or just go ahead and pick out some services for them. That's 662-638-3310. The Blow Dry Bar at gmail.com. If you'd like to send them an email, if you have questions, 1801 Jackson Avenue in Oxford, 10 to 6, Tuesday through Friday, Saturdays, 10 to 3. And when you get the gift card for a blowout, rebelgrove.com gets mentioned. You get a discount on that. So take advantage of that. You got baseball games, basketball games coming up. Send uh, the woman in your life to uh, the blow dry bar. Let her have a good day. You can maybe get off to the game or if uh, you can do both for uh, for each other. Because I, I, I've had a couple members of the 4% say that, hey, we do like sports too. Don't uh, don't stereotype us like that. So they're right. I, I apologize for that. You but, should. Yeah. You owe the apology for that. There's a lot of women who like sports. That was a stereotype that is uh, that is incorrect and chauvinist and probably uh, simplistic on my on my part. So I'm proud of you for uh, for showing some personal growth there. Good for you. A lot of different uh, options, a lot of different services. BlowDryBarOxford.com. So, all right, uh, where are we at? Uh, I'm not surprised, Jay. You, you were going for some of this. You uh, you had to go try to get a little healthy for a second. Um, Bruce Pearl a little worried about Kermit tomorrow night. Yeah, it should be. Kermit's had some success there over the years. Yeah. Uh well Bruce Pearl knows he knows he knows the deal. He knows the deal. He's been in this league for a while. Been successful in this league, had struggles in this league, rebuilt programs in this league. He knows and he's great at TV. Dude's great at TV. He knows what he's he knows the deal. Look, Kermit's a really good coach, man. I mean, he, I've always known he was a good coach. He's a better coach than I thought he was. And I thought he was, like, on a scale of 1 to 10, I thought he was a solid 9. Dude's a terrific coach. He'll have Ole Miss ready. If Auburn doesn't play well, Auburn won't win. Now, if Auburn plays really well, I don't know that Ole Miss has enough. 
Well, yeah, there's going to be a lot of teams this year where if they have their A game against Ole Miss, Ole Miss is simply just going to be outmanned. It is what this it is. is. Where, yeah, this is where, like, on the message boards, it, 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 because people can't hear tone, they, they, they don't really know what you're saying. What I'm saying is about this Ole Miss team is that so far through 13 games, not a huge sample size, through 13 games, this is a team that wins with offense and overcomes its defense. That is not the way he's going to build his program. Two years from now, 24 months from right now, good Lord willing, we're still talking about this stuff on the podcast every day, we will be talking about Ole Miss giving teams fits on defense consistently with length and smarts and athleticism and uh, we'll be talking about his one three one just giving people fits we really can't do that right now other than reputation and spurts now they gave Vanderbilt some fits late they've given teams some fits but for the most part they haven't been a terrific defensive team they've been a very very efficient, explosive, offensive team. It's not criticizing them. There's people that they, they it, it's just this is this is the worst team that, that Kermit's going to have at Ole Miss. And if you're an Ole Miss fan, that ought to be really exciting. This is the worst team he's going to have. If Kermit's at Ole Miss eight years, this will be his worst team. Not by records and all that stuff because injuries happen and schedules are different. You know what I'm talking about? But in terms of just looking at them on the floor, this will be his worst team. Because he's going to recruit a different type of big. Kermit has played, I mean, has coached incredibly well. He's been impressive, as you said. And now, look, this, this path is the reason he's in Oxford, and it's been an advantageous, great thing for Ole Miss currently. It's a little bit of a shame that he was at middle as long as he was and he didn't have at least a power five program to coach and, 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 and kind of go ahead and get that, that, that next step in his career before now. Oh, and if you're Ole Miss, man, you got to be so thankful that Mississippi State screwed that up a few years ago when they hired Rick Ray. Oh. They, bring, they bring in a Kermit Davis in his 40s to Mississippi State at that point where he would have inherited talent. Oh. Ooh, son. Yeah. I mean, he, he had the A&M gig, but that was almost 30 years ago. I mean, completely different yeah, Kermit Davis a, than then. That was a different time and age. That, that, that Mississippi State failure to hire him when they hired Rick Ray is something else. If you're oh. Ole Miss, you got to go, whoo, we caught a break and didn't know it. Yeah, had, had, had no idea what was going on there. Cause... Not only would he not be your coach today, he probably would have them at an elite level. You think he'd still be there? Huh? You think he'd still be there? Yeah, probably so. I mean, you know, I mean, he's from there and um, has a lot of family ties to to that school. Um, I would dare say he knows his way around Starkville pretty well. I mean, you know, yeah, he'd be he'd be scary there. Look, I think Ole Miss is going to be ready to play tomorrow night. I do. I, I you know, I mean, and I think Bruce Pearl knows it. Jay, Jay and Bruce have a pretty good relationship. If, if, if Jay says Bruce is worried about this game, Bruce is worried about this game. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm by it. Kermit said yesterday, you know, Auburn, Auburn's had a lot of time. This is their first SEC game. He said those kids and, and, and Bruce are probably tired of watching Ole Miss film. They're ready to play. They'll be ready to go. They're not going to overlook Ole Miss. That's the, the one negative if you're Ole Miss when you go beat Vanderbilt by 10 on the road. Bruce didn't have a hard time getting his kids' attention on Sunday morning. When he said, hey, we got we to gotta be ready to play. These guys are good. Had Ole Miss gone over to Vanderbilt and lost by 22 points, his kids would be like, come on, man. Come on, coach. Now they, they, they know. I expect a really good basketball game. I, I think it's going to be a great environment. Um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I really do. It's going to be one of the most fun SEC games for Ole Miss since they uh, built the pavilion. Maybe maybe the most fun SEC game for Ole Miss since it built the pavilion. If you don't count the opener, you know, when they played Alabama, when they opened the building. And that was that would have been a big environment if they played ULM that day because it was a new building. But um, it's, I, I anticipate a, a, a completely different atmosphere than maybe what we've seen 
at uh, Ole Miss basketball games in a while. Yeah, and kids I'm, still don't I'm get back curious. for another week and a half, I think. Almost yeah, I'm, I'm really curious. Yeah, because a lot of the games the last couple of years, I'm not, I'm, I'm not making fun of fans here at all. You know me, I'd never do that. But, you know, there was a lot of novelty to the pavilion, and, and people would go to the games, and, and like, um, you know, they'd kind of hang out over there by the food court area and visit and talk and stuff, and they'd straggle to their seats and that kind of thing. And, you know, it was, whatever, it's fine. You pay your money, you do whatever the hell you want to do. I don't have a problem with it, but I anticipate it being more basketball-focused tomorrow night than it's been in a long time. And I hope that's not coming across as a criticism because I don't mean it as one at all. I mean, if you buy your ticket and you want to hang out in the food court and visit with your buddies, that's cool with me. I mean, it's, it's your money. Do what you want to do. I, I anticipate there's going to be more focus on the basketball than, than there's been in in a long time. Uh, if this is proven true, I hope this uh, indespicable news for the day, hope this person has tried to the fullest extent of the law. Uh, this comes out on the AP wire nine minutes ago. Authorities said a Florida man has been charged with making death threats against the mother of Tyler Trent, a Purdue University superfan and cancer activist who died January 1st. A Volusia County Sheriff's Office news release said John Matthew Pinkham, 39, was arrested Monday at a Deltona, Florida home and charged with making written threats to kill or injure, including multiple posts using an alias on Facebook. After the news of the former Purdue student's death, the authorities said the post included threats of violence at a vigil scheduled this week for the West Lafayette, Indiana school. Why? I have no idea. Because people are crazy. They are. that Because that, that young man and his family. Being held on $10,000 bond, I would frankly not have bond as an option there. Yeah, I'd put him at $10 billion bond. Jill I mean, Records did not list an attorney. Yeah, good luck there. Yeah, good luck. That's through. That's where even the yeah. even even the public defender guys going. Are you kidding me? Yeah, he goes. Come on. That's where he makes a call and goes. Come on, don't don't. This isn't fair to me. Yeah. I didn't. Well, what have I done to you? Yeah, I'll give you ten if you'll get me out of this one. Yeah. Ah. <sighs> anyway. Just, I, oh, I'd rather I'd rather defend almost anyone than I would defend that. Jeez. You I mean it's about the Auburn Purdue game? I mean, you know, that that I can't even imagine what that was like. I mean, that's um I guess you can to a to a, a degree. Um I mean they flew down to that game on I think Robert Ursay's Colts plane. Correct. Um knowing that was it. They knew that was his last trip. There was no doubt. Yeah, I mean, I we had this. I had this conversation with some buddies when he came out for the coin toss. He's having a hard time keeping his eyes open. I thought, you know, so many moments have been uplifting. This one's just sad. This it one just the, looks tragic. Yeah, it was the reality of it, you know. And and um, you know, I saw him some pictures of him at the. I guess there was like a breakfast the day before the game, or or maybe two days before the game, or whatnot. And a lot of the Auburn players and stuff went up to him and. <clears throat> I don't know. I just thought for his family. I mean, his family was, it would be tempting for a family to be very selfish with those last hours. And they didn't. They they knew that his story had, uh, it, it was the word I'm looking for. It had, uh, it had spread far beyond Indiana and Purdue and their, their home. It was a. Uh, yeah, it had gone viral in the most positive connotation possible. Uh, he had inspired so many people. And um, and they shared him at the end in a way that, um, you know, he told me one of my children was dying and, and, and had 48 hours to live, 72 hours to live. I, it'd be hard for me to share much of that time. No, uh, no, no good, no good segue out of there. We'll close with this: the uh, the odds to win the twenty twenty national title, as mentioned with our conversation with Jay a second ago, how you would definitely take Clemson and Alabama. This shows you from a betting standpoint how far ahead those teams are. As of this morning at the uh, Westgate Superbook, you can make a bet on Clemson at plus 180. That means that um, if you bet $100, you would win 180 to uh, if Clemson wins the national title. Alabama's at 250, so bet 100 to win 250, two and a half to one, basically. And then past that, Ohio State and Georgia are at 12 to one. If you'd like to completely waste your money, you can get Michigan at 14 to one. 
Oklahoma is at 15 to 1. Uh, Texas is at 20 to 1. Nebraska 25 to 1 for some reason. Washington 25 to 1. Florida 25 to 1. Notre Dame 25 to 1. Texas is 20 to 1. And then um, Oregon is 30 to 1. That's it. Or at least the top ones. You wouldn't yeah, even that's... think about taking. I mean, I guess you could take a flyer on Ohio State at 12 to 1. That'd be about it. Yeah, and it would be nothing but a flyer. Saying that Fields gets eligible and he's actually as legitimate as they hope he is. That's it. Yeah, it'd be. But I need better than twelve to one for that. Yeah, I mean, if I'm putting ten bucks down, I mean, that's a you got ten bucks burning a hole in your pocket in Vegas. Check out, I'll, I'll roll the dice on something. That's that'd be a good gamble. But no, I'm not putting like a thousand on it. Yeah, I don't feel good about it. I mean. Frankly, I wouldn't take anybody but Bama and Clemson going into the season. You'd have to convince me there was a reason why. Yeah. We'll have some football this week. I do expect we'll hear from the coordinators. And then um, more on the uh, on the show. Again, Gary Parrish tomorrow, and we'll, uh, we'll go on from there. So a lot of basketball this week. Ole Miss and Auburn tomorrow night at 6 o'clock from the, uh, the Pavilion. We'll talk to you tomorrow.